to Congressman Michael Waltz of Florida, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, House Armed Services Committee, Intelligence, former Green Beret. This guy's the real deal. So it's very good to have you back with us, Congressman. Um, Thanks, Neil. There was pressure, in uh, or Peter Ducey reporting from the White House, uh, for more or less telling Israel not to go slow, but be careful. In other words, if a pause were to stop, don't go nuts. That was my interpretation, Congressman. Uh, Peter Ducey himself might correct me, but what do you think of that? Well, Neil, I think there's, there's three, maybe four kind of phases, pieces of this. One is the obvious, you know, get the hostages out. Hamas is going to continue to buy time by trickling these hostages out. That gives them time to refit, resupply, reorganize uh, after the, the Israeli offensive uh, and present themselves on the international stage and the propaganda and the PR war as humanitarians, as, as benevolence, which is pretty incredible, but that's what they're that's what they're doing to some effect. The next piece uh, is what happens in southern Gaza. That's what you see the administration trying to influence. Uh, my advice is stay out of the Israelis' way. Uh, we have an interest in terms of the American hostages. I want to hear more about what's happening to the U.S. citizens still uh, under uh, under Hamas's thumb. But what will happen in southern Gaza? And then the big unanswered question is, Post Hamas, what does it look like? Is this a UN force? Is it an Israeli occupation? Is it some type of Gulf Arab multinational military? Is it the Palestinian Authority? That seems to be the big question. And then finally, Neil, and this is, this is the crux of it all, all roads lead back to Iran. And until this administration reverses course on Iran, this is all going to continue to happen, whether it's a year from now or five years from now. Well, us House Republicans are taking action. We are voting today uh, to sanction the uh, six billion that went for the hostage exchange and make sure that money, whether it's fungible or not, however you want to argue it, is not used to further terrorism. You know, we're learning as you were speaking there, Congressman, 30 Palestinians are going to be released today. Uh, part of this continuing exchange. It, it, it's looking like about 10 hostages when all is said and done on the Israeli side. And that continues what has been a ratio, something like three to one, Palestinians released versus Israelis released. Um, I don't know the breakdown of those uh, Palestinians, whether they were all in jail or just being monitored by the government, but it is a little lopsided. What do you make of it? Well, I think it's incredibly lopsided and in how we've come to this ratio of, you know, the, the worth of an Israeli life versus the worth of a Palestinian life, I don't know. But I can tell you, aside from the numbers, these are literally babies, children, uh, elderly women that Hamas snatched out of their homes after brutalizing their families in front of their eyes versus criminals uh, that worked through uh, an Israeli court system. Uh, so it's not just the numbers, it's the, uh, it's, it's the offense of which there was none versus, you know, some have been stabbing uh, uh, offenders, uh, people that have bombed bus stations and conducted other types of terrorism. So that's the issue too, but I think the bigger piece, Hamas took these hostages, the Taliban does it, ISIS does it, they do it, the Iranians do it uh, for hostage diplomacy to gain concessions, to buy time, uh, and it, you know, they're literally using these people's lives uh, to get to, to, to gain uh, their objectives. And it's not just Israeli lives, they're doing it with their own people, with the human shields that they're using. And we should call it out at every turn. You know, Congressman, I had a former Ambassador Gilliman on with me, and like other Israeli officials, I had a spokesman for Benjamin Netanyahu on uh, the day before. Uh, mm. and, and to a man or woman, sir, they've been saying the same, even if the United States tells us to cool it, we won't. Even if the United States says to pause uh, hostilities, you know, indefinitely uh, to secure ongoing hostage releases, we won't do that. Now, now that risks a great deal of wrath between the White House and Israel because we give them a lot of money and support. And some right. in, in Israel could interpret that as being on tender hooks if, if, if they go ahead and ignore uh, us. But again, every Israeli official with whom I've been speaking has said that. If it comes down to that, with all respect to the United States, with all respect even to this president, we won't do that. We cannot do that. What do you think? Yeah, Neil, I mean, you know, put yourself in their shoes. Let's go back to September 12th, 2001. 
Uh, it was take the gloves off uh, and, and, and put bombs on these, on these terrorists' foreheads. Uh, I have had to go into schools and hospitals getting shot at while getting shot at by terrorists hiding behind civilians, and we literally lost men, lost American soldiers trying to go room to room when the much easier thing would have been to do, frankly, was, was just eliminate the entire building. So I have every confidence that the IDF, as, a, as an army that follows the laws of the rule and, and rules of warfare, will do everything they can, not only from a human rights standpoint to avoid civilian casualties, but they know it's being used against them in the global propaganda war. The Israeli military knows that, their political leadership knows that. I just don't see why we feel the need to go into their war cabinet, why Secretary of State Blinken feels the need to go into their war cabinet and lecture them about human rights when the abusers are on the other side of that wall in Gaza. And that should be what we hear from Blinken, from Biden, and the entire administration is continuously and constantly calling out the terrorists for who and what they are. But Senator Cotton uh, on the Sunday shows was right. It seems like we're putting more pressure on the Israelis than we are on Hamas or their backers in the UN or the anti-Semites on the left. Do you know, at the rate we are going, uh, Congressman, we could see 10 hostages released every day on the Israeli side. I'm off a little bit, but, you know, after today, we'll have maybe 190 hostages that we know of uh, still in, in uh, Hamas hands or some of their private operatives. We don't know. Um, that would take a lot of days of pauses to get them all right. out. And the flip side is the fear that if the, uh, the war resumes full throttle, those hostages are in peril. How do you balance that? Well, it's, it's frankly, Neil, I mean, it's almost impossible to balance. My understanding is there's a, about a dozen women and children left. So one would think that at least uh, we, would, we would pause long enough to get them out. Uh, but then, you know, God help those men and those soldiers uh, that, that were taken. Uh, because at some point, you're going to have to you're going to have to make that tough decision. Uh, Bibi is going to have to make that tough decision because every day that goes by, Hamas will regenerate, regain strength, and you have to weigh what those hostages, the price they're going to pay, versus those soldiers that you're going to have to send in. And then on the international stage, I believe it is going to get exponentially harder every day that goes by for the, uh, for the Israelis diplomatically and from a PR standpoint to restart. You know, that's, uh, that is a brutally tough decision that only uh, the elected leadership, the political leadership of Israel can make. You know, uh, Congressman, I appreciate your patience here. Uh, we're showing a scene in, in, at the Rafah crossing. This connects Gaza with Egypt. This is this passageway uh, for some of these hostages to get out and get medical attention. Uh, but again, we're waiting to see the proof of these so-called 10 that are now about to be released. But the fact of the matter is uh, that at, the, at this rate, uh, Hamas has had built up seven days now where some Israelis fear they, they, they can regroup and do what they have to do or want to do to, to, to extend this war and heighten this war, even with the attacks yesterday by Palestinian gunmen right in Israel itself. So they have right. not really changed their ways here. And I'm just wondering what you make of that and whether, well, it's very good to have hostages back in safe hands, um, that this might be doing more harm in the longer run. Well, and remember what, what else is happening at the same time in these pauses is that supplies are going into Gaza. And I have yet to hear a clear explanation from the administration on how we're assuring that Hamas and its thousands of fighters aren't siphoning the fuel, the food, the medical supplies, which we they know they have long historically done and taken that and prevented that from going to the Palestinian people and used it for their own ends. So you have those supplies they could be siphoning, resting, refitting, repositioning. But then also, I have not seen uh, in the briefings I've received uh, that we are interdicting the rockets, 
the munitions, the weapons that we know Iran is sending across Iraq, across Syria, and through its various infiltration, its tunnels through the sea, its various smuggling right, routes as well. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, Hamas is getting stronger with every day, and that's the balance that the Israeli military is going to have to make, weighing the fate of those hostages with weighing how much more difficult, how many more soldiers they're going to lose when they restart, and then the international dynamic. But again, what I want to hear the administration talking about is not lecturing the war cabinet on these tactical issues, is how do we deprive the backer of Hamas, Iran, of the funds that it is using to fund this war machine, either on international oil markets, through secondary sanctions, which we have passed now in the House, on shipping and ports and refineries, on the hostage money, on the foreign currency reserves, on the loans that they're getting on the international community. All of these loopholes is what the administration should be talking about and should be shutting down. Again, not lecturing a, a, a freely elected sovereign war cabinet. Um, real quickly on that very point, Congressman, I've actually looked into the finances available to Iran, and it's sitting on uh, anywhere from 15 to 20 trillion dollars, uh, and that, that that is just what it has in its country right now, regardless of what we might or might not freeze in accounts held abroad. So what's to stop them from saying you can do whatever you want, U.S. You can freeze till the cow comes home. We're going to keep keep doing what we're doing because we're, hey, look, we're just fine right now and the oil revenue we've already got made seven trillion dollars in, in in the last few months that's a fair point neil i mean you know we're, we're we're now sitting on the results of two years of turning a blind eye out of this vain hope this fantasy and fairy tale of re-entering uh into the jcpoa so it will take some time but the sooner we start uh, drying up those funds again, the sooner we start going back right. to maximum pressure. I mean, remember, uh, by the end of the, the Trump administration, they were down to $4 billion in foreign currency reserves. By the estimates I've seen, they're back up over $30 billion. So the sooner we start cutting it off again, the better. Yeah, I, I misspoke there. It's a $20 billion at, the, at that rate. Yeah. But very, very good point on all, sir, and I appreciate it. Uh, Congressman Mike Waltz of uh, Florida. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.